Signore e signori, possiamo ricominciare i lavori. E prima di tutto vorrei ringraziare organizzatori e il professor Ortalli e tutti i suoi collaboratori per aver eh, fatto questo colloquio in un modo così bello e così importante di punto di vista scientifico. Grazie. E cre credo che adesso possiamo eh, metterci al lavoro. E prima di tutto vorrei dare la parola al eh, professor Christ eh, from the University of Manchester School of Arts che will speak about trans-Mediterranean embargoes. Uh, grazie molto anche della mia parte per l'invito per l'organizzazione di questo magnifico uh, convegno e grazie per l'introduzione. Adesso comunque um, continuerò in uh, inglese per non confondere troppo perché cioè, adesso ormai uh, i preparativi sono in questa lingua. Um, parlerò su trans-Mediterranean uh, trade uh, regime o è piuttosto una domanda e possiamo parlare di un Uh, uh, trade regime uh, di un'organizzazione del commercio trust mediterranea comparing Venetian and Mamluk responses to the sack of Alexandria. What's the uh, problem I would like uh, to talk about? Well, the uh, historiography um, on the sack of Alexandria uh, is a, a controversial one. There is a debate about what this sack of Alexandria meant uh, in practice. Atbury and in um, the Silage or the wake of his work, many others suggested that this um, crusade against Alexandria of 1365 was primarily motivated by uh, economic um, uh, reasons. Um, among us today, uh, Professor Jacobi um, opposes this opinion and argues Commercially, this was a foolish enterprise, it made no sense, and it has to be uh, identified as a proper crusade. Another controversy is about the impact. In the Mamru Chronicles and in the wake of or inspired by these chronicles, uh, also in the historiography, the modern histori historiography that is, on Alexandria, uh, we find this opinion that the sack of Alexandria in the mid-14th century spearheaded or instigated the urban decline uh, of Alexandria with the shift of, sort of the center uh, uh, of, uh, of the settlement outside uh, to the north, outside of the city walls and so on, and the general decay uh, of, um, of uh, urban services. Um, in another place, I think I gave some reasons to doubt this interpretation and to wonder whether there was really a major impact uh, of this sack uh, on Alexandria and for that matter the organization uh, of trade in um, Alexandria. But that's not the reason why um, I started to uh, think about these things. The reason was that I encountered a strange attitude of Venetian chroniclers towards uh, this um, Crusade. I was looking for other things, and it struck me that Morosini is not talking at all about this enterprise. And Caroldo has a very interesting, ambiguous attitude about it, and escapes sort of uh, uh, some uh, questions, uh, as I shall uh, show uh, in a moment. I propose three hypotheses. Um, they're easy to reject. Um, the idea is obviously to kickstart the discussion, not to be right about that. The first is crusade and commerce perhaps are not this far apart and not irreconcilable. So maybe it's not so much a question whether it was economically motivated or um, spiritually motivated or a crusade, but how these two things um, were uh, cobbled together, implicated uh, in this enterprise. I would further argue that crusade and military action are both part of a wider process of renegotiating um, trade regimes in the Eastern Mediterranean. But that the failed crusade, um, and I will come back to that question, that's another controversy, you could say whether it was a failed enterprise or not, um, is a game changer. In this game, case, a very important game changer because, I would argue, also Czech 
best to think about whether this might have fostered um, um, Veneto, Mamluk symbiosis in trade and naval uh, matters. I will talk a little bit about the background, and this will be for some of you extremely boring because you're much more expert in this topic than I am. And for others, maybe it's necessary, so forgive me. Um, I will try to make it short and snappy. Then we'll talk about the Cypriot project. Again, forgive me, that's for you, uh, David, uh, rather boring. Um, you know all about it. And then the Venetian response, uh, and finally the Mamluk uh, response. So Crusade post-1291, I would suggest that there are a few important changes, and certainly when you go into the details, there are many more changes and so on, it's all more complicated than that. That goes without saying. Um, the the Passagium Pas uh, uh, Generale, I would argue, is de facto suspended. Of course, it's still prominently present in the literature, in the literature at the time, uh, uh, that is, in crusading treatises, but I would argue that Perhaps with the ex exception of Clement V, nobody really believes in Passagium Generale anymore. So it's the time, really, of the Passagium Particulare. And this Passagium Particulare, i.e. Um, preparatory step, uh, which should be foregrounded and now primarily uh, uh, taken in this time, beginning of the 14th century, in order to prepare the Passagium Generale, i.e. the proper reconquest of the Holy Land, is of uh, much more practical importance, and we'll come back to that in a second. It, and it is indeed, I would suggest, under this umbrella of the Passagium um, Particulare, which militarily speaking, we would call that today uh, the, crea the creating um, ideal preconditions for the success of military action. Yeah? The, the, the créer des conditions favorables uh, in the French military parlance. Um, under this umbrella, Rhodes and also Cyprus organized their, and justify uh, their policies, both commercially and uh, militarily. So it's under this um, suspension of the proper crusading enterprise that more shades of grey are possible, trade is possible, uh, certain tactical um, arrangements, um, tactical alliances even with infidels are, are possible, under uh, this uh, umbrella because it's all about creating the necessary conditions uh, of strength uh, to succeed in the Passagium Generale to come. The papacy supports uh, these, well, spearhead uh, um, often and supports uh, these enterprises both financially, ideally, but then also, uh, uh, thirdly, with trade embargoes by banning uh, trade, in this case affected with in the case of Alexander, particularly strongly affected the Venetians. Um, these embargoes, I just had a discussion with David about it, they were not very successful for a while, but then from Clement V onwards, so from, the, uh, from about 1310, uh, the Venetians start to feel um, the effect, and uh, uh, Professor Dali, also present here, wrote a nice piece about uh, how the Venetians coped uh, with this embargo juridically, which I think is very, uh, obviously, very uh, important line of coping with the embargo. It's not just militarily or, or by smuggling, but the, 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 the juridical strand. Um, so as a result of this, Venetian trade is indeed uh, suspended, almost suspended uh, for a while, um, until about uh, 1344, um, when the papacy is then finally easing uh, um, uh, the uh, embargo. What's the modus vivendi, which is appearing in the meantime? Um, well, the different coping techniques obviously applied. Uh, smuggling is a certain importance, but uh, one important thing seems to be that Famagusta becomes a more important hub uh, also uh, for uh, the Venetians. Another thing is happening in this time, the first, first half of the 14th century, which is the rising perception of a Turkish threat which conceptually changes the uh, crusade because it now creates two crusading options which are not quite much, well, theoretically not mutually exclusive, but practically uh, almost mutually exclusive. In the crusading treatises, we find these uh, shifts from 
um, Passagium Generale du Particulare uh, reflected and proposed and the stronger, much stronger emphasis on the economic aspect of the Passagium Particulare. How do we have to regulate the economy, Mediterranean trade, in order to create these favorable conditions for the crusading enterprise? Um, if Ramon, um, uh, just pick um, Guillaume Arde with a very radical solution, with a total embargo of trade, with a fleet active in the Red Sea, completely unrealistic, and uh, with a complete disregard for um, the possible use and necessity of uh, uh, the transit trade uh, from uh, India to Europe through uh, Egypt. Um, Sanuso the Elder, very different from that, offering some practical solutions. How can we impose these embargoes and at the same time continue to uh, obtain the uh, goods from uh, India in illicit way, through Armenia, for instance? Or how can we substitute goods uh, that are now prohibited by other goods? The memoranda of the practitioners, they reflect even stronger the, Passag the Passagium uh, Particulare. So, uh, for instance, in the proposals um, um, written by, or projects by Henry II of Cyprus, uh, by the um, uh, Grand Master of the Hospitallers and those of the Templars, a very strong emphasis on the suspension of the Passagium Generale and how exactly this Passagium Particulare should be organized. And surprise, surprise, it is much um, uh, favoring uh, positions uh, and projects of, um, well, in the case of the Hospitallers, obviously the uh, taking of the island, or the, the conquest of the island of Rhodes, uh, etc. What's the economic background? And now, forgive me, that's now an even wider sweep. Um, there might have been climate change, it's all debated, I don't go into detail there. Um, the plague is a little bit less debated, that there was a demographic change. What is very much debated is what the effect uh, of um, the plague and, well, the possible climate change behind it was on the demand for oriental goods, uh, especially spices, especially pepper. Did it go up or down, or did it remain more or less the same? Not so clear. Um, there are reasons to believe um, all three things. Um, the third option, not much of a change, a certain continuity is pretty well documented, while the other things are a little bit tricky. Probably in the first, first years, obviously, there was a disruption, but uh, then actually uh, the demand was rather increasing, I would say. However that uh, may be, we have in this time rising prices in Famagusta, rising pepper prices in Famagusta, um, which would um, create an incentive for the Venetians to go um, themselves directly to Alexandria to uh, save a little bit uh, of money. And uh, this is the main reason, it's not the question, but in any case we have in this time, 1345 onwards, um, the Venetians resuming uh, direct trade with Alexandria without, and see that you agree with that, without giving up altogether, obviously, trade with Cyprus. So it's trade with Cyprus and Alexandria. Last point I would like to emphasize um, are the ongoing diplomatic uh, relations. So there's a very tight net or very high rhythm uh, of uh, uh, diplomatic missions. Uh, not just between the Venetians uh, and the Mamluks, but more importantly in this case between Cyprus and uh, the Mamluks. And there has been, on the whole, good relations, um, as has been pointed out before by uh, David, for instance, um, between the Mamluks and um, Cyprus. Now, to the sack of Alexandria comes as a little bit of a surprise. What's the context? Even more so when we look at the context. The context is the crusade of Smyrna, so nothing to do with the Mamluks. Protectorate of Korikos, conquest of Antalya, all nothing to do with um, the Mamluks. Now, King Peter travels in Europe, and that certainly uh, was alarming, in order to raise support for his crusading enterprise. Um, there's lot to um, much talk about uh, the liberation of Jerusalem, of course, and I ask the question to you, uh, it was not so clear, I guess, where uh, this uh, crusade uh, would have uh, been uh, directed to. In this context, obviously, also then um, a tightening of the uh, papal embargo again. Um, and now here um, you have um, sort of the, uh, the news ticker of what happened then in 1365. So first, uh, a fleet is um, 
the, fleet, the Cypriot fleet of Cypriot plus allies are gathering in the area uh, of Rhodes. There are also a few Venetian ships, and this much emphasized in the sources. Um, the Venetians also supported the enterprise in other uh, ways, which I will come back to uh, in a second. Did they have the Turks in mind? Most probably they did. They didn't think of an attack on Alexandria. Um, so what was this decision to head sort of in the last minute? It's also interesting when you read, um, when you even, even when you read sort of propagandistic pro-Cypriot uh, accounts, uh, Guillaume de Machot, uh, it is, seems to be pretty much a spontaneous last minute decision. Is it just the booty? Because Alexandria, there's much more to plunder, much more to find. Uh, or is it not a reason as well? I will come back to that. Um, it happens in any case. Uh, so the fleet um, oops, takes its way to Alexandria. Alexandria is plundered. Also, the Western assets are plundered. So this is not a very well organized um, plundering or dividing up of the booty. This is full fledged looting. Um, so also the Genoese, uh, Venetians. The Cypriots themselves, as uh, was pointed out, uh, lose assets. Um, so there's no discrimination, everything is plundered. Now, um, the Cypriot king would like to stay there, and it's not clear how permanent he would like to occupy Alexandra, but he tries to stay there at least for a while. Uh, but his soldiers basically, or his barons, basically abandon him, and um, when a Mamluk force uh, is approaching Alexandria, from Cairo, the last uh, crusaders with uh, the King of Cyprus leave uh, Alexandria. So was it just a failed enterprise with no effect? Well, let's look at or measure it, measure the outcome against what, that's purely um, um, conjectural, uh, might have been the possible objective. What seems to be clear and rather uncontroversial is that for the participants in this crusade, i.e. for the barons, uh, the objective was very straightforward and simple to understand. Uh, it was to make good their investments, uh, to have uh, a payback, i.e. to plunder, to make as much booty as possible. Now, for the king of Cyprus, it's not so clear, but um, let's assume he wanted to stay there permanently, then it would mean a Cypriot uh, emporium uh, in Egypt. And this is interesting, it seems fantastic, but this is an idea which remains palpable in the crusading treatises. For instance, Pilotti talks at length about how Alexandria, and it's particularly because of the trade uh, that runs around Alexandria, is the key to every successful um, um, crusading enterprise and therefore should be permanently occupied. More likely than a really long-term permanent occupation was probably that uh, the king counted on using Alexandria, controlling Alexandria for a while, to use this as a strategic pawn or bargaining chip in order to renegotiate the status of Cyprus vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Mamluk Empire, uh, including trade, but also including a possible uh, um, um, uh, return of the Holy Land uh, under the control of the king. That's in any case what he demands uh, in his sort of offers for a peace settlement uh, shortly afterwards. So it becomes very clear. This seems to be part of an ongoing diplomatic relations, uh, part of an ongoing process of renegotiating the status uh, of Cyprus, of the Mamluk Empire, uh, of uh, the Holy Land. Now, in this case, it was not a big success. The Mamluks, and we'll come back to that in a second, uh, did not really pay much attention to this uh, proposal, and in the end, the settlement was status quo ante, with few punishments or some really aspect of a punishment. And I'll come back to that as well. So the Mamluks punish well, the transgressors, um, 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 and then the status quo ante. So not a big success, yet there is substantial I would say, propagandistic gain. I mentioned before that we could call it a controversy or we could have a debate about whether this was, militarily, militarily speaking, uh, a success or not, this enterprise. Well, measured against the aims or the objectives of the commander, i.e. King of Cyprus, it was certainly not a success. Measured against 
uh, the aims of the barons? Maybe yes. Yet, the king managed, the king advises of the king, or the help of the king, support of the king, managed to turn it into a partial victory by changing the narrative about it. By changing the reporting about this uh, event. So what was foregrounded was um, how they succeeded in landing in Alexandria, how they succeeded in breaking into Alexandria, how they succeeded in taking a big plunder. And this was marketed uh, here in a particularly uh, um, splendid way uh, um, in, for instance, uh, 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 Marshall's uh, account uh, of um, the deeds uh, uh, of the king. Well, is it just purely propaganda without for the benefits? Probably not. Propaganda in this case is extremely important and can mean money. And we find this similarly reflected in the problems the hospitalers in Rhodes are facing. The bread and butter of Rhodes hospitalers' finances, one might argue, was maybe not the bulk, but substantially uh, coming from trade. So they had to they had to uh, uh, cultivate uh, commercial relations. But another stream of income would come through the fact, or motivated by the fact, that they were defending Christianity, supposedly. So how could you optimize the combination of the two things? Now, in Rhodes, they come up with a very clever solution of the Castle of Bodrum, no strategic importance, what I can say, uh, but very important in order to make a claim that they're still fighting the infidels without doing any harm, really, um, so without jeopardizing uh, trade relations. Uh, so propaganda in this case is a very important element. It justifies or uh, it serves to, to buttress the claim that Cyprus, that Cyprus is entitled to special streams of income because they're defending uh, Latin Christianity. So what's the Venetian attitude? Interestingly, there was a certain disagreement in the Senate regarding Egyptian trade before the Crusades. And this maybe helps us to understand, uh, could be a clue to understanding why uh, the Venetians did not, right uh, from the beginning, reject uh, this, uh, this enterprise. Um, the reason for this disagreement were probably strong Venetian interests in uh, Famagostovich makes sense. After decennies of trade concentrating on Cyprus, lots of Venetians, and the Venetians had a very good relationship uh, overall with, with Cyprus at, this, uh, at that time, had strong interest in Famagosta, and they're probably not interested uh, very much in uh, uh, retaking uh, or reopening the direct routes to Alexandria. So maybe that's partially the reason. I guess the more potent reason is that it was not so clear where this crusade was uh, 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 directed to. Um, but there might have been another reason that despite of the possibility that it might go against Alexandria, some Venetians did not object to it. Um, so the Venetians took sort of a, we know about certain things, um, but we stand by attitude and then we will see what happens afterwards. We should also not forget that even the Venetians could not escape the general, sort of, how should I call that, the cultural, religious imperative to participate in some way or the other in crusading enterprises. The traditional Venetian wall was to transport crusaders, obviously, or more importantly, at the beginning of the 14th century, to provide um, galleys um, 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 to uh, crusading parties. So the beginning of the 14th century um, in, uh, well, ultimately abortive uh, um, project uh, against uh, the emperor, uh, the Byzantine emperor, uh, then later to the hospitalers for conquest of Rhodes and so on and so forth. And we have the same, the same here, so this, this naval um, technical aid in naval matters uh, granted. Yet, as soon as they see that this crusade is a failure, they back off and proceed to damage control and don't want to have anything to do any, anymore with further um, um, attempts to 
uh, continue attacks uh, on the manual code. So they send an embassy uh, to Cairo, and here is the ex uh, you see a little quote from Garoldo, a commando simil novità è proseguita senza alcuna intelligenza di veneziani, which is not likely at all. It's actually very, very unlikely that there was no intelligence uh, whatsoever. Um, and this embassy, obviously, the Sultan is not buying that. He says, you knew exactly, um, you were well treated here, uh, you had all you wanted, uh, you knew exactly what was happening, you didn't say anything, and now you will be punished. Um, then the Pope um, tries to enlist Venetian help uh, for Cyprus or for the continuation of the enterprise. And now the Venetians take a very, compared to, well, still in the words of Garoldo, but uh, in comparison to, 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 uh, to how he talks about Papal-Venetian interaction, normally a very, very determined uh, stance against it. And obviously here we find in the nice stereotype uh, the encounter in many other places. Esposo uh, il sito e condizioni di Venezia, so uh, the position and condition of, the, of Venice, which has no fields and uh, um, no vineyards and uh, no, no other possession other than um, trade, and therefore, which obviously already in this time is a lie. That's, that's just not true. They have other possessions. They are absent in the same time. There is agriculture and so on. Um, but that's a stereotype, an effective one, to make the case that the Venetians have to be excused from further uh, crusading enterprises and uh, that they rather have to work with uh, the Mamluks now and need to be exempted from the embargo. What's the Mamluk response? Well, the Mamluk response to the Venetian embassy um, right after uh, the, the sack of Alexandria is there's no way that you get away now with a special treatment. Don't even try uh, to say that you didn't know about it and with your special friends and blah, blah, blah. Here, I'm not talking as your friend. That's basically how it's, how it's rendered in this, in this chronicle, and that seems very, very, actually very re realistic. Here I'm acting as the sultan who has to uphold general justice, not just in Cairo, not just in Egypt, in the world. So I have to punish um, uh, the malefactors uh, according to the to their, their injury, to the injustice uh, done. Um, very, very realistic, I say, because this reflects uh, 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 an ambition very strongly emphasized in um, the invocations or the, 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 the titles used at the inception of, um, um, well, tr uh, trade treaties or trade decrees uh, uh, um, or well, tr decrees related to, 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 yeah, to, uh, to trade privileges granted to the Venetians. So this invocation of the function of the, the Sultan as, uh, um, well, as having chiefly the role of upholding justice among everybody, basically, in the world. So this idea of justice, it's very important, find obviously also reflected in uh, all literature, uh, um, Arab, uh, Islamic uh, thinkers of the time, and even Khaldun, for instance, this is the most important thing the ruler has to do. And so it's so strongly emphasized, obviously, that it even makes its way into a Venetian uh, chronicle. Um, che farebbe ciò che si convenisse alla giustizia senza dargli alcuna speranza della liberazione a uh, loro. So, uh, an abortive embassy, ultimately. Uh, rather what the Sultan does, uh, he retaliates, seizes Venetian and other Western goods and persons. Um, the final settlement is unclear. So, there's some sort of seminatio memoria in the chronicle. So, Morosini um, does, does not mention the, the issue at all. Um, there could be for other reasons. He's very short in this year's. Um, Garoldo concludes uh, his, uh, he reports um, mainly in two places uh, about the further attempt to uh, release prisoners and to reach a peace settlement with the Sultan. And at the end of the second uh, report, he concludes, non si trova memoria alcun better something or what exactly happened, but because there is no memoria, it was probably positive. So, assuming the prisoners were released. It's not very probable. Then I think of uh, sort of a parallel event in uh, 1416 after the Battle of Gallipoli, so not the ones in the First World War, but the ones in the 15th century. Um, there are similar problems in reaching a peace settlement, or sort of in, in reaching a hope now, whatever, uh, 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 an understanding with the uh, Ottoman Sultan, because the prisoners were already sold. So that seems to be a problem, uh, which would be interesting to investigate, but we don't have the time for that because we're running out of time. Um, uh, sort of the expiry date of prisoners 
uh, in uh, at the Mamluk uh, or Ottoman court. Obviously, they are worth a lot of money. I don't know. In any case, they disappear, seem to disappear, and that's a, a big uh, challenge uh, for uh, to find a settlement. So in the end, there's not really a settlement found, uh, uh, reached, but uh, we have then in the Deliberatore del Senato, or in Caroldo, sort of laconic remarks that we heard that this is settled now by the Cypriots, so we retake, uh, we resume um, 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 our uh, trade and send off uh, a convoy. Right, so what are the lessons learned by the Mamluks? Did they learn something regarding how to control better, how to better control the coasts and the seas? The bottom line for the Mamluks seems to be increasingly in this period, um, but I'm happy for Mamlukists to, uh, to uh, stand with me there, increasingly uh, as an effect of, well, again, a complicated story, uh, climate change, demographic change, and so on, decline of agriculture, also perhaps mismanagement. In many cases, the transit trade as a stream of income becomes more important and has to be continued. On the other hand, there's this, this, this top boss in the literature that the Mamluks were really a land-based, or operated in a land-based imperial mode. Um, 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 Aldrich Fuss, Fuss suggested um, this raised coast hypothesis, and well, it's very well corroborated that basically they retreat from the coast because they found the coast was uh, difficult to defend. But as Benny showed, and uh, as it's clear in the case of Alexander, they could not retreat from the coast. The coast meant generating the streams of income. So how did they resolve uh, this uh, problem? Well, we have the worms on a piece of wood uh, um, image in Ibn Khaldun. Right? Ibn Khaldun tries to explain why the Mamluks are positioned in rather weak as sea. And he says, well, because it's just not a very honorable thing to do. Um, cling on to a piece of wood. That's not what the man does, uh, probably, of course. Um, so there was no permanent navy, yes. Um, there was something very interesting, and I would like to talk about that, but I will do that, that will be for another, for another time. A dormant naval capability. Uh, I discussed that yesterday over, la over, over dinner. They, sometimes the Mamluks were constructing fleets, and these fleets, they had problems to find the destination, and there were lots of problems, of course, but they could, in relatively short time, muster uh, conspic uh, uh, conspicuous fleet. Um, not for a long time normally. Uh, so it didn't resolve the problem of everyday policing. So how did you make sure uh, that you dealt with pirates, like the things a Coast Guard or a Navy has to do sort of in the courant normal? Well, I suggest they did that uh, uh, by delegating the Dominium uh, Maris to uh, the Venetians in the north and in the south to an extent to the Rasselis, but I'm not on very safe ground here. They buttressed this integration of Venice into the Mamluk realm by uh, um, giving the consul a certain status um, um, uh, by granting the Venetians these privileges and integrating, integrating them also to a certain extent into the Mamluk uh, imperial uh, taxonomy. So they were not really others, they were part of uh, the uh, system. And the Venetians are pragmatic enough to not uh, object to that. Right, let me conclude very briefly. Uh, the sack of Alexandria, war in general, I firmly believe, so maybe not today so much when you think of how, uh, how we deal with the Islamic State, but in this time it's pretty much part of a diplomatic, ongoing diplomatic process of nego uh, negotiation. Um, so we cannot separate the two things. And what is negotiated here? Yes, among other things, trade regime. How to split the gains um, um, of uh, this uh, um, transcontinental uh, uh, trade, uh, and also, I would say, about the role of the papacy uh, in imperial politics, or in sort of, well, to call it imperial or um, expansionist, or whatever, or international politics, uh, 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 about keeping an active role um, in uh, sort of uh, in this political theater. Now, victorious crusades, as we see very nicely when we, when we fast forward to 1416, the Battle of Gallipoli, uh, serve a double purpose. First, it's a bargaining chip with the enemy. So you can say, I, I was beating you, so now you have to, uh, what we negotiated maybe for the last 10 years, but now you have to give in because I, I changed the presentation for a negotiation. But it also um, is important 
to be used domestically, or sort of within the Latinitas, to buttress um, um, your position as a crusading state. So the first thing the Venetians do on 1416 is to send off letters to all the rulers of Europe saying, we, we um, won a great victory over the Turks, which means God is now aside, and whatever you have against us, you are wrong, and so on and so forth. So immediately, um, the propagandistic machine uh, starts. And here is the same case, although even though it was not, uh, it was not really a, a victory, but rather a defeat. Now, what's this? Uh, yes. What's the difference between a, a victory in a crusade and a defeat in a crusade? Well, the propagandistic use, at least an attempted propagandistic use, we can still uh, uh, notice here. Yet, I would say that obviously the Venetians were not convinced by that propaganda, and for the Venetians, it was a turning point towards uh, a new uh, Mamluk Venetian symbiosis. Now, that here sounds very positive, and probably not this positive. It's not that the Venetians love the Mamluks, they don't try to argue that. It was for, probably for lack of a better option. Um, so the Venetian attitude I would sum up very, very hastily and very, very, very tempt, I only got to say in German, uh, such crusades, fine. Uh, but do it properly, i.e. keep Alexandria under your control so that you can give us then your privileges in return and, you know, as we had it, as to, re to go back to the golden times of Acre, so to say, right? So do it properly. If you do not, keep in Tiamonoi. No? then leave it to the specialists, to us. Uh, crusade, for us, means Turks. Um, trade, we do with the Mamluks, um, for lack of a better option, as I said, but we don't talk much about it. And that would maybe explain also this conspicuous um, silence or the last in memoria in the Venetian Chronicles. Thank you very much, and sorry for going over. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Christ, for your very interesting uh, communication, uh, which uh, puts a very interesting question about the background of the crusade, a changing of crusade policy. We will have questions afterwards, as usual, and I would like to say that we have only two uh, communications now. One is uh, of Professor Arbel, whom I gave the word just now. The other is Angelica Zavara, uh, because uh, Professor Nanetti is not present, he is, he is not assisting, and that's why we will make a coffee break at 3.30. Three, uh, uh, and after, we will have a communication of Professor Zavara. And now I would like to give a work, uh, to give the floor to Professor Benjamin Arbel from the Ten, uh, Tel Aviv University, he will speak about life on board of Venetian ships. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Adriana, do you hear me? Mi senti? Va bene, ciao. I'll parlerò in, in inglese questa volta, mi dispiace. Uh, um, the title of my paper is Daily Life on Board Venetian Ships, The Evidence of Renaissance Travelogues and Diaries. A 16th century joke attributed to the, Venetia, to the subjects of Venice in the uh, North Italian mainland refers to Venetians who, after mounting a horse for a trip in the terraferma, raise a handkerchief about their head in order to verify the direction from which the wind is blowing. <laughs> this joke indicates uh, uh, to what extent sailing was considered an integral part of the life of early modern Venetians. Even the term terra ferma <laughs> uh, is very significant. That's the, that's the part of our of our state where, where you don't, you know, shake all the time, <laughs> uh, as, as you are used to do. Uh, indeed, the very scarcity of Venetian descriptions of life on board ships reflects this reality, paradoxically, I would say. It often takes a foreigner to describe 
uh, deeply rooted customs that are taken for granted in a given society. This is why most accounts of life on, on board Venetian ships were written by non-Venetians who were less accustomed to sea voyage. Until the mid-15th century, travelers hardly bothered to record life on board the ships that carried them between Europe and the East. This is the geographical area that would interest us in this paper. Only from the second half of the 15th century, with the process of cultural secularization well advanced, do we get detailed descriptions of the long time spent at sea, of navigation, ship management, and life on board. The new interest in maritime affairs is expressed in travelogues written by people originating from different cultural backgrounds. Their accounts were often published in their own time, in print already, and in some cases even translated into uh, many languages. These travelogues constitute the main basis of the present paper. It would be impossible to expose and analyze here all aspects of maritime life as depicted in these sources. I have therefore chosen to focus on the impact of navigation methods on life on board, on several other aspects such as the rhythm of life, accommodation, provisions and meals, animals on board, pastimes, music and festivals. The, the guiding question all along this paper is were the characteristics of daily life on land, uh, at sea, sorry, simply a continuation of those, of the, the patterns of life on, on land? And if not, in what ways were they different and what sort of factors had a particular impact on life on sea? Sea voyages between Venice and the Eastern Mediterranean in the 16th century, I would say in the long 16th century, would normally last four to five weeks on the way eastward and one to between one and two months in the opposite direction. Still today, if you take the plane, <laughs> it's not the same time going eastward or, or back. Most of the time, especially when when traveling on board the big round ship, time uh, was spent at sea without contact with the outside world, except for occasional encounters with other vessels, and a few short, very short stops at three to five ports in each direction. This fact, as well as the limited space and great number of people on board, up to nearly 300 individuals sometimes, must have influenced human relations on board. As far as the crew was concerned, though comprising members of different ethnic and cultural background, I, I, I'm speaking of Venetian ships, common experience in the, fee, in, the work frame, in the framework of multicultural, of the multicultural Venetian milieu, as well as the interest of seamen not to lose their jobs must have somewhat attenuated tensions or at least directed them into consensual solution. Felix Faber, a German traveler who wrote a detailed account of two sea voyages carried out in the 1480s, reports, for example, that before reaching Venice, the crew members elected three persons to handle eventual claims of crewmen against one another. Passengers, however, did not have such mechanisms to solve potential conflicts. Overcrowding of the sleeping compartments, snoring neighbors, and lack of consideration on the part of many travelers led to quarrels with chamber pots occasionally thrown and burning lights 
uh, to put them out. Long and boring days were often spent in drinking, and the possession of weapons, knives, by passengers could result in dangerous brawls. The French pilgrim Pierre Barbatre reports that after leaving Jaffa on the ter return voyage from the Holy Land in 1480, the pilgrim galley on which he sailed was lying for a long while in a calm. No wind, you know, you're staying. This is, uh, seamen were always afraid of this situation. I mean, you couldn't, you know, put put on the motor as you do, you do today uh, uh, when you don't have wind. Members of the crew claimed that it resulted from the presence of two Jewish passengers who were in real danger at that situation. They suggested simply to throw them into the sea overboard. On the ship that carried John Locke from Venice uh, to the east in 1553, a dispute among some Dutch passengers developed into a free-for-all, which forced the captain to confiscate weapons and knives from all passengers. Conflicts related to the Reformation and Counter-Reformation must have further augmented religious tensions between Catholics and Protestants. The Englishman Lawrence Eldersley had to face a difficult moment on a Venetian ship during a storm off Crete in 1581. It was claimed that his presence on board and his refusal to participate in Catholic rituals to appease the elements were endangering the entire ship. The Venetian pilgrim's galley did not offer much comfort to their passengers who had to bring along their mattresses, sheets, pillows, and blankets. In 1497, official legislation fixed the space allotted to each passenger on these vessels at a width of one foot and a half, 52 centimeters, that's all. Sleeping berths were arranged without any space between them, with the name of the passenger inscribed on them with chalk. Chests and trunks obstructed passage in the central gangway. Since the pilgrims, uh, uh, pilgrim galleys often also carried merchandise, the space left for passengers was, was even more restricted. Felix Faber had to lean his mattress against a sack of spices during the trip home. The same author observes that one could hardly move in the sleeping berth without touching one's neighbor with fleas, lice, gnats, and worms, not to mention the continual noise and, I quote, various foul vapors, <laughs> unquote, were rendering the night in the pilgrim galleys quite unbearable. Traveling on a round ship, bigger ship, it could offer greater comfort. Arnold von Hau, for instance, was accommodated during his ship to Alexandria in 1496 in a private cabin aboard a ship sailing to Alexandria, Alexandria yes, as I said. But he too had to bring along his private sleeping equipment, including a hand basin, I quote, in which to spit and to be sick. <laughs> Meals uh, were an important component of the ceremonial routine on board. As on the mainland, they also had special, uh, had social and cultural significance, but the cramped space and the limited accessibility to luxury provisions somehow mitigated the extent to which social hierarchies could fully uh, be exposed during dinners. Besides, pilgrims were support, supposed, at least in principle, to behave modestly. The travelogues reflect the tension between the tendency of upper-class passengers to sleep apart and the limitations imposed by the special uh, circumstances of sea voyage to keep apart, excuse me, to keep apart during, during dinner. On the pilgrim galleys, there were uh, three dining tables and paying passengers were entitled to receive two meals daily. To the sound of trumpets, writes Fabri, 
all passengers rushed to the dinner era, uh, area to get hold of a good seat. Although there were also women on board, they were not expected to participate in the common meals, but rather to remain in their berth and berths and have their meals there. The custom of having three different dining tables on board seems to have uh, kept, uh, been kept also on round ships, on the bigger ships, as described in detail by Alessandro Magno, who, uh, whose diary uh, includes uh, several crossings on such vessels. Uh, yeah. Excuse me just a minute. The uh, dinner arrangement uh, followed a, a certain hierarchical order, but not strictly so. Thus, the captain's table included, apart from the noblemen and rich passengers, the scribe and pilot, Nokier, Two other, uh, uh, two officers whose respective occupations necessitated, in the pilot's case, some learning, the capacity to read charts, maps, and tables, to make calculations, etc. And in the scribe's case, good administra administrative practice, including, of course, reading and writing, as a daily routine. But the barber, the carpenter, and the corker were manual laborers. Their inclusion in the captain's table on the Venetian ships is an interesting phenomenon, difficult to explain except as an expression of the uh, uh, tra virgolette, democratic, democratic spirit that, according to Ugo Tucci, singled out the Venetian merchant marine from other maritime milieus. This trait could have presented a challenge to upper-class passengers who were un unaccustomed to share their dinner table with barbers, carpenters, and corkers. The second table was for the steward, Scalco, the cook, the barber surgeon, the scribe's assistant, and those passengers willing to pay a little less uh, uh, for, uh, for their uh, meals. Uh, and the, the, third, the third dining table was really for, for, you know, for the low, lowest, lowest grades uh, of, of the uh, crew members. But on Easter Day, everybody on board sat around a single table for the holiday meal. Sailing several weeks uh, with little or no possible possibility to replenish these stores necessitated carrying along great quantities of food and water on board. Diet also depended on the type of ship and to a certain extent on the status of person concerned. At the upper, uh, okay, uh, yes, at the upper echelons of galley society, fresh meat was consumed on a regular basis. This fresh meat diet puts Mediterranean ships or Venetian ships on a higher level compared with Oce oceanic ones on which apparently only dried and salted meat was consumed. But judging from Felix Fabri's account, eating fresh meat was not always an advantage, since the captain gave precedence to butchering uh, of worn out and, dis uh, and disabled animals. In privately owned vessels, meat uh, was consumed at least three times a week with uh, sardines and salted cheese on the other days. Wine or water diluted with vinegar were served with the meals, depending on the table on which you were seated. Passengers, however, did not entirely rely on the ship's supplies, acquiring personal provisions before embarkation in Venice or along the route. The restrictions on the volume of personal belongings uh, that were allowed to be carried along by uh, travelers were not always applied to the letter. Personal provisions included flour, firewood, ham, sausages, salted ox tongues, cheese, eggs, 
bread and biscuits, dried fruit and spices. Arnold von Harf brought with him two kegs of fresh water and two small casks of wine. One author even suggests taking a cage with half a dozen hens as well as half a bushel of millet for their feet. Anchoring at port towns during the trip provided an opportunity to acquire fresh supplies. Jewish travelers had special diet dietary requirements related to religious strictures. When stopping at Corfu in 1495, an anonymous author of a Hebrew travelogue replenished his personal supplies with bread, cheese, grapes, and peaches. Another Jewish traveler, Elijah of Pesaro, uh, bought at the same port in 1563 good meat, presumably kosher meat, salted fish, sour grapes, watermelons, lentils, onion, and garlic. However, bread, according to Elijah, was a very bad quality, of very bad quality there. At Zante, Zankintos, he found kosher cheese. The regular supply of fresh meat to passengers and crew could only be ensured by keeping live animals on board. Indeed, our sources reveal the presence of herds, whole herds of such animals aboard merchant galleys. The account book of the Galley Quirina of 1414 includes entries for the acquisition of 142 sheep heads, seven oxen, in addition to knife, uh, nine quintals of butchered meat. Felix Fabri describing the pilgrim galley that took him to the Holy Land in, in the 1480s mentions sheep, goats, calves, oxen, cows, pigs, all standing together in a stable located near the kitchen. According to Elijah of Pesaro, each merchant galley of the kind of which he sailed from Venice to Cyprus carried 40 to 55 sheep, two or three oxen, five to six calves, and a great variety of poultry. These lists are impressive in their dimensions and variety, considering that one had also to ensure sufficient quantity of food and water for these animals. I have not been able to find similar references with regard to round ships, but one may assume that live animals were kept on them as well for the same purposes, and probably even in greater quantities because there was more, uh, larger space available. Keeping many slaughter animals on board necessitated, of course, additional provisions. Water in particular seems to have constituted a problem since whatever quantity was available, it had to suffice for both human beings and animals. On Felix Fabri's first voyage to the Holy Land, Scarcity of water led the captain to deprive animals from this vital resource. But animals could also travel on Venetian ships as uh, uh, Felix Fabri reports on the presence of horses, donkeys, and mules on the upper deck of the galley, not for consumption. <laughs> One traveler records the drowning of the, the drowning of parrots that were carried by pilgrims as souvenirs from the Orient in 1486. A parrot also accompanied one of the pilgrims returning to Europe with uh, Pietro Casola in 1494. The Swiss pilgrim Melchior Zurglinke well, <laughs> brought a monkey from his pilgrimage to Jerusalem in 1590. Fal Falcons caught on Cyprus, Crete, and uh, Kithira, and other Venetian possessions were transported on board Venetian ships to Venice on a regular basis. These birds were competing with human passengers for the provision of meat on board. Falcons have to eat meat every day. One traveler even complained that the 150 falcons transported on his ship in 1520, consumed more meat than all passengers taken together. Quite a different purpose was behind the presence of cats on board. Ships 
loaded with great quantities of foodstuffs and sometimes also larger quantities of merchandise, such as grain, sugar, etc., constituted a virtual mice paradise, as attested by Felix Fabre's account. The, ship cat, the ship's cat was therefore an important personality. And it should not surprise us that when a cat fell off the ship into the water, an incident described by John Locke, half a dozen crew members were immediately dispatched in a boat on a rescue mission. <laughs> Locke wondered whether so much trouble would have been taken had a man or a, a human being fallen into the water. <laughs> but the cat, he writes, belonged to the captain. And Italians, according to Locke, were particularly fond of cats. Pre-industrial societies, urban ones, are known to have been accustomed to close contact with animals. Yet close quarters became even closer on board ships. And for a couple of months, animals of various sorts thus became travel companions, sharing the limited resources on board with human travelers. Their presence, including both its pleasant and unpleasant aspects, thus became part of the daily and nightly experience on board. The accounts of Renaissance travelers attest that music was an important part of life on board. Trumpets were blown at daybreak and sunset on ships, on the ship's departure, on hoisting the sails, when calling to meals and on entry into port. Encounters with friendly vessels at sea were also celebrated, besides by the firing of cannons with the sound of trumpets and fife, fifes, as observed by Elijah of Pesaro of Corfu. Trumpets also greeted important passengers, such as the Duke of Crete, who boarded the galley taken by Pietro Casola. The sound of the silver whistle used daily and night, day, day and night by the comito or mate to signal orders to the crew and the confirmation of the crewmen also made by whistles must have been quite, quite a nuisance, especially during the night. But such instruments could also be employed for sheer entertainment. The British Library preserves a collection of music belonging to a Venetian trumpeter, Zosi Trompetta, who in 1447 and 8 traveled on one of the Flanders galleys and played on demand at weddings and festivals. Singing also seems to have been a common phenomenon on board. Felix Faber observes that at night, one mariner always kept his eye on a compass, on a compass, <laughs> uh, chanting, Chanting, I quote, a kind, a kind of sweet song, unquote, which showed that all was well. Passengers traveling on the same galley also passed their time in singing, besides playing various instruments, such as lutes, flutes, bagpipes, clavichords, and zithers. On the merchant galley they transported, uh, that transported Elijah of Pesaro to the Levant, there was constant amusing, amusement with the sound of flutes, trumpets, drums, harps, violins, and organs. According to Alessandro Magno's records of his trip to Cyprus, there was always a passenger who played some musical instrument and accompanied the dancing and singing of the crew. A very gay company. Religious festivities, in particular, offered an occasion for merriment. The pilgrims, the, uh, uh, some pilgrims, uh, um, Milanese pilgrims who, who traveled uh, to the East um, in the 80s and 90s, have left descriptions of dancing, singing, and hand clapping on the Feast of St. John. The ship's gun was used to mark holidays or special occasions. Easter Sunday, for example, was celebrated by four sounds of gunfire, in addition to a festive meal around one big table. On another ship, the day of resurrection was announced by three sounds of gunfire, Moschetti. 
musicians could also be hired at ports visited by these ships. The list of expenses of merchant galleys on their way westward in 1476 includes a payment for a group of musicians who came on board to play and dance for the passengers and crews during the ship's stay at Syracuse. Other pastimes, such as playing cards and chess, reading and writing, weightlifting, <laughs> swimming and fishing during calms, were recorded by Felix Faber in 1483 and by Leonard Rauwolf in 1573. Besides these activities, Fabri also mentions the catching of flies and vermin as a regular pastime. During longer stops in various sports and uh, uh, other activities could be practiced. Alessandro Magno refers, for example, to archery and running on the beach. During the stay of the ship Croze, in Crete, on the way back from Cyprus to Venice, Magno and his travel mates enjoyed the company of, I quote, beautiful Jewish women, unquote, who came on board. <laughs> this passage was censured <laughs> by the French translator <laughs> of, this, of this text. <laughs> Just dropped it off. <laughs> During, uh, during his stay on the same island in the spring of 1562, the same traveler, uh, together with other companions, even engaged in falconry. To conclude, ships, as depicted by early modern travelers, constituted a very peculiar milieu of human activity. The limited space packed with people far more densely uh, uh, densely than anywhere on land, was a small world apart. In principle, intended to be always on the move with a few short interruptions. Moreover, ships were very precarious vehicles of transportation in which passengers and crews were particularly vulnerable to various menaces that awaited them en route. Besides, unlike their normal way of life on land, voyages on board these ships found themselves during several weeks or months at very close quarters with strangers of different social extraction and different cultural backgrounds, as well as with animals of various sorts. At the time, and at uh, the same time, and they had plenty of time, being able to observe their surroundings at leisure. Overcrowding necessitated a great measure of organization and also a great amount of consideration compared with normal life on land. It enabled people from different social, religious, and ethnic milieus to see and experience each other's modes of life on a daily basis, a situation nearly rarely encountered on land. On the other hand, there was the perennial risk of potential conflicts and violence. The long days and nights at sea also uh, intensified the importance of activities that were normally of a more occasional na nature, particularly various pastimes, musical activities, religious ceremonies, and law. The phenomenon of death at sea was not treated here, but it must have left its mark on voyagers. Nearly every Traveller has at least one p description of death at sea and describing how th the corpse was, you know, thrown overboard to the water. Even the butchering of animals must have been a rather unpleasant experience for urban travelers unaccustomed to such dramas since slaughterhouses had by then been removed from the center of the great urban agglomerations such as Venice. Briefly, ships can be considered as social laboratories in which many sides of human experience were intensified for, the li for a limited time of a sea voyage. The accounts and diaries of our maritime travelers offer a unique opportunity for the study of activities that in, normal, in the normal course of life on land were much more sporadic, often hidden from the eyes of strangers and consequently also from those of the historian. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Arbel, for your most illuminating and very interesting conversation about the life uh, of, on Venetian ships. Uh, we shall continue this discussion after a small break. So now we have a break of 10 minutes, and then we have one more paper. And after that paper, we can put questions and organize a discussion. Thank you.